Good afternoon, and welcome to our webinar today on building a resilient drug supply chain. I'm Mark McClellan. I'm the director of the Duke Margolis Center for Health Policy at Duke University, also an independent board member at Johnson & Johnson's. And today, our webinar topic couldn't be more timely. Uh, we've seen in COVID-19 the importance of building a more resilient, robust drug supply chain, both to address the pandemics, the drugs, the advanced biologics, the vaccines that are so critical for response as well as to prevent and alleviate shortages of critical products. Some of these have been going on, instability, price changes, uh, unavailability for a decade or longer. So if we go to the next slide, our event today is gonna consist of three sessions. The first is gonna focus on how resilient the US drug supply chain is today, how we can take steps to uh, define and measure that resilience, and what factors have contributed to the current disruptions or weaknesses in the supply chain. This is gonna include a brief presentation from our deputy director, uh, Marta Wozinska, and also a panel discussion that Marta will moderate. Next, our second session will consider what a more resilient drug supply chain would look like and what changes could be made to move toward that responsive system. This session is going to be a panel discussion moderated by Margolis Center Research Director, Adam Croach. And then finally, I'm going to moderate our third session in which the panelists will discuss some concrete, concrete next steps that Congress and regulatory agencies could take in the near future to alleviate drug shortages and build a more resilient supply chain. So we've got a lot to cover today and just to um, help frame briefly before we jump into this first session, a little bit of background on the regulatory and legislative context for the discussions that we're having today. Drug shortages, as I mentioned, are not new to the US healthcare system. We're gonna talk more about those today, but the COVID-19 pandemic has really focused attention in Congress and the administration on this issue. Uh, for example, a recent executive order from the Biden administration called for an assessment of supply chains, which will provide a preliminary readout in June and then a full report uh, coming next February. Also, uh, prioritizing our actions to improve supply chain resilience is critical. Uh, in this process will be some attention to issues like onshoring the production of medical products, uh, areas where that's cost prohibitive or not, and where the priorities might be for addressing uh, onshoring and other issues. And maybe there are other ways to have more uh, cost-effective approaches to improving resiliency, such as increased data sharing, more effective drug purchasing contract practices that provide uh, for more stability and reliability uh, over time, more public-private collaboration on these issues. And the next slide uh, that I mentioned the, the sort of the full reports, good way of framing some of the issues that we're going to be facing, um, will, is going to provide a more comprehensive look at onshoring needs. So uh, we'll obviously be learning a lot more about this issue before the report comes out. And that's where this webinar and our further work and the work by many of the people we'll be hearing from today uh, will come in as well in the coming months to address risks in our supply chains. And uh, we should also uh, think about the best ways to provide uh, on onshoring incentives effectively. Um, we want incentives that are going to get the right response, uh, but hopefully uh, do so efficiently with effective use of, of, taxpayer, ta of taxpayer dollars. So uh, through this whole process, executive order, uh, expert analysis, further attention to these issues, uh, we hope to be able to provide some useful guidance for Congress, for the administration, uh, as we respond to the challenges in uh, supply chains and issues related to onshoring and reliability and resilience of the supply chains as well. Uh, there are a number of legislative proposals that are very relevant to these issues right now, as the administration is continuing to, to build the evidence base and take steps to uh, assess and address supply chain issues. Uh, Congress is also taking steps to address supply chain resilience. The American Jobs Plan proposal from the administration calls for $50 billion in a new department within the Department of Commerce dedicated to monitoring domestic capacity 
for production of critical goods and help stabilize that capacity. The proposal also includes investments in monitoring uh, domestic uh, capacity and tax credits for manufacturers in some industries. And while this isn't specifically focused on drugs, biologics, and vaccines, the bill provides opportunities to improve drug supply chains through, for example, funding of increased production capacity, innovative manufacturing technologies, uh, such as continuous manufacturing, maybe regulatory innovations to help promote more uh, stable uh, supply chains. Um, and again, uh, prioritization here is going to be really important. Uh, Congress is also exploring legislation aimed at reducing United States reliance on China as part of these onsourcing efforts as well. Uh, those proposals focus on tax incentives, tax credits, uh, other kinds of uh, uh, tax breaks for organizations working in the medical and pharmaceutical uh, fields within the United States. So a lot of material to bring together uh, to determine the best way for these and other potential steps to affect the resilience of our drug supply chains. Uh, with the right steps, uh, the right analysis, the right data, the right incentives, and the right policies coming out of it, uh, certainly some opportunities for making major progress on these important issues. So with that, I'd like to get going. I'm gonna turn over uh, now to, to Mara Wazinska to kick off our first session. Uh, thank you so much, Mark. Um, so let me begin by introducing our four panelists for this session. Um, we will have uh, Stephen uh, Schandelmeyer, who is co-principal investigator for the Resilient Drug Supply Chain Project at the Center for Infectious Disease Research and Policy at University of Minnesota. Uh, Dan Kistner, um, who is the group uh, senior vice president for pharmacy solutions at Vizient. Michael Levy, who is uh, senior vice president digital and um, innovation at USP and Rina Conti, who is Associate Research Director um, uh, and Professor um, at the Institute for Health System Innovation and Policy at Boston University. Uh, but before we move to their opening remarks, I will present a brief framework for analyzing the resiliency of our drug supply chains. So if you could pull up the next slide, please. So to get us started, I would like to um, have us uh, think about what supply chain resilience means. In particular, a good way to think about supply chain uh, resilience is to, um, uh, is to think about the ability of supply chain resilience to withstand shocks. If a supply chain is not resilient, uh, supply shortages, um, so, uh, shortages will ensue. The more resilient the supply chain, the less likely are the shortages. And when they occur, shortages are smaller in scope and duration. And there are many different shocks that can test the resilience of drug supply chains. The most vivid right now is a pandemic. This is a shock not only large in size, but it is correlated across many markets, many countries. Um, other uh, relevant demand shocks can be more localized. For example, natural disasters or bioterrorism. We can also have demand increases uh, resulting from behavioral responses to real or perceived supply chain disruptions when supply chain participants drive up demand for a product because they're worried about a shortage. On the, supply, uh, on the side of supply shocks, the most prominent uh, trigger relates to manufacturing quality problems, which in turn cause disruptions in production when uh, the manufacturer works to um, address those quality problems. Historically, most shortages in the United States have been caused by manufacturing quality problems. And it is worth noting that those shortages have been most often caused by manufacturing quality problems at US-based sites. And the problems with emergence production of vaccines um, is another example. Natural disasters can also cause disruptions and Hurricane Maria was a great example of that. Cybersecurity and other geopolitical inference, um, interference uh, issues which we have seen during this pandemic uh, when countries limited uh, exports to some drugs or their ingredients, um, they are also uh, relevant supply shocks. So, and to the extent to which these uh, shocks turn into a shortage uh, depends on a number of factors. If production processes are not fungible, meaning we cannot readily ramp up production, a shock uh, to the supply chain will more likely result in shortages. Inventory practices can also have implications. Um, market concentration also very much matters. If you have one supplier that's responsible for 50% of production, a disruption there can be very difficult to make up by other manufacturers. And as we have seen throughout this pandemic, lack of systems to coordinate a response when uh, one is needed also really matters. 
we could turn to the next slide. Now let's look at example of supply chains. So this slide is FDA's representation of drug supply chains. But what is important to note is that the culprit of most drug shortages is upstream in the supply chain and not at the wholesaler distributor level. Yes, um, there can be important last mile considerations when uh, there are rapid increases in demand and the healthcare system cannot accommodate, but up upstream is a limiting factor both in supply and demand shocks. What is important to understand is that upstream supply chain is really complex. If we could go to the next slide. In this slide, you can see what a supply chain could look like for a sterile injectable product. Just look at the sheer number of raw material suppliers. To make a sterile injectable product, you will need primary packaging, so specialized um, glass, plastic, syringe barrels, etc. You will need the active pharmaceutical ingredient, or API, which in turn requires a supply chain of its own, along with specialized equipment. Uh, you will also need excipients, so substances that uh, are needed to make the drug in addition to the API. It could be talc for a pill or saline for an injectable and a number of other uh, materials. And all this before you go to the fill and finish manufacturer, which has a lot of complexities of its own, plus you will need uh, many uh, other supply chains uh, that um, are needed to administer the product. So for example, syringes, uh, syringe caps, et cetera. So with that in mind, I will um, now uh, ask for the panelists to, uh, to come on the screen and uh, turn it over to actually Steve Schundelmeyer for his opening remarks. Great, thank you, Marta. And that's a excellent uh, overview and introduction. Uh, several topics I've been asked to address. First is what is drug supply chain resilience? What do we mean by resilience? And resilience is really a constellation of concepts. And it's a term that we use in many domains in the US these days, but resilience has to do with capacity to recover quickly, with ability to spring back or be flexible and respond to challenges. Uh, adjectives such as flexibility, elasticity, anticipation of change, adaptability, durability, toughness, strength, and depth come to mind. Historically, in the drug supply space, um, we focus on drug supply resilience primarily as the ability to uh, recover uh, and fix the supply chain as quickly as possible after a failure has resort, resulted in a drug shortage. And in other words, a fail and fix type system. We wait till there's a shortage, then we go and fix it. Uh, I think increasingly in the pandemic has pressed upon us that we may need to look for a new paradigm or an additional paradigm. And that's what I would call uh, uh, a predict and prevent paradigm where uh, we're looking for the ability of the drug supply chain to predict and adapt to prevent impending drug supply chain disruptions or shortages. In other words, uh, we would develop a sentinel system that looks for and identifies uh, signals that may precede a supply chain disruption. Then we implement a process to help uh, the market adjust and adapt to the um, uh, signals that are seen. And through that, we can predict problems and prevent them before they occur as much as possible. We would still need the fail and fix system if uh, there are breakthrough shortages that get through the predict and prevent process. So to focus that, I would say the drug supply chain resilience is the ability of the drug supply chain to predict and adapt to prevent impending drug supply chain disruptions, and to recover or fix the supply chain as quickly as is possible if failure does result in a drug shortage. So we need to predict, prevent, fail, and fix uh, all as a part of resilience. Um, at the University of Minnesota and, and at SIDRAP, we've been working on the drug supply chain for a couple of years, and our goal is to develop a map of that drug supply chain and very quickly, we realized that uh, we have pretty good information on the drug supply chain downstream from the time the product uh, leaves manufacturers and, and marketers and goes to the wholesalers and downstream. There are still issues we need to monitor and make sure that drugs get distributed efficiently in the U.S., but many of the shortages occur because of lack of supply upstream uh, before the product gets to the wholesaler. And so we've decided to focus on that. 
We've identified at Minnesota a set of critical acute drugs that would be needed in emergency settings to take care of patients. We've also developed uh, with the advent of COVID, a, a set of uh, critical COVID related drugs that are needed. And we're uh, just about finished preparing a set of critical chronic medications that if they disappeared from the system would cause substantial harm to patients in the marketplace. Um, in terms of markers or outcomes we look at uh, to indicate resilience, we look at the number of ongoing drug shortages that exist. And in the US at any point in time, we may have uh, 150, 200 ongoing shortages at any point in time. We also look at the length of time it takes to recover from shortages. And um, the last time I looked, the average length of drug shortages on uh, the FDA list was about one year or longer, which is a, a, a tremendously long period of time for shortages to persist. Uh, also, we consider ability to identify and predict these sentinel events as a measure of our resilience of our drug supply system, uh, and then identifying processes that will help resolve that quickly. Um, at the University of Minnesota, uh, we've looked at the supply chain and we're mapping it uh, with data from many areas. Our primary source is FDA and a comprehensive set of drugs at the NDC level in the U.S. marketplace. And we feel strongly that we need to map the entire U.S. drug supply system so we have a sense of the whole. Right now, there are many stakeholders in the system that do have um, a supply chain or look at the supply chain from their perspective. So FDA may look at the supply chain as it relates to approving a drug to be on the market in the U.S. or with respect to certain quality measures that FDA uh, monitors. A wholesaler might look at the supply chain to say, where am I going to get the drug I need to supply my members? Or a GPO may do that as well, and we'll hear from busy a bit later about their supply chain mapping. And large chains and large hospitals, major purchasers all map the supply chain. But these are all largely siloed views of the supply chain. It's where am I going to get the drug I need for my patients, not what's going on in the U.S. market as a whole, and how are those things affecting uh, the probability that I will or won't get that drug. So on the one hand, we have a lot of stakeholders with siloed supply chain views and maps, and that's important, that's necessary, it's useful, but it's not sufficient to avoid uh, shortages and to uh, have a, a resilient drug supply uh, chain in the market. No one really has a market-wide view of the entire drug supply chain uh, in the U.S. Uh, FDA has a broad perspective, but they don't have, as they admit, they don't have information on production capacities and quantities uh, and, and dollar volumes of drugs sold by various players. Uh, individual uh, wholesalers and, and GPOs have fairly broad sets of drugs that they can define the supply chain in terms of where they're going to get the product, but they haven't uh, aggregated this to look at the market as a whole. Uh, we need to track um, the drug supply chain on a market-wide basis rather than just on a siloed basis. And I think we can do this by collaboration among each of the parties that have different views and begin to aggregate that into a master database that, that everyone can draw upon and use. I think among the things that we've learned in this uh, COVID-19 era is that there are some new challenges to the drug supply chain that we need to deal with. Uh, and quickly, I think one of the um, earlier, Marta showed you a slide that uh, talked about the supply chain and had the a representation of the manufacturer. And one of the things we've realized is today the drug manufacturer is not a singular entity. They don't do simply one function. And in fact, we've moved away from a model uh, that I would call the single manufacturer model, and we moved to a general contractor model. The, the manufacturer is much like the general contractor building a house, and they may hire an electrician and a plumber, a carpenter, and all the skills needed to put a product together. But there are many different corporations involved in the supply chain that we euphemistically call the manufacturer, but it's not a single entity. There are very few models where the product is made, put together, uh, and put out the door as a finished product by the same manufacturer at a single site or location. 
But if I could turn it over at this point to Dan Kistner for remarks. Hi, Mara, are you, are you able to hear me? I can hear you, yes, thank you. That's good to see you and thank you everyone. Uh, my name is Dan Kistner. I lead the pharmacy program here at Vizient. If you're not familiar with Vizient, uh, we work with over 50% of the hospitals in our country, our members really around lowering costs, improving quality, and uh, growing their market performance. I have the privilege of leading the pharmacy team at Vizient, pharmacists by background. And my team every day is dedicated to two things, which is on how are we gonna lower drug costs in this country? And how are we going to eradicate drug shortages? I, again, I just want to thank the Duke Margolis team so much and my fellow panelists and presenters today. I see a lot of familiar faces, um, but these are all the same people who share the same passion I have, which is to end drug shortages. And, and I think we're getting there. I think we are making some progress. I mean, you know, you look at the data today, uh, you know, we did have the lowest number of new drug shortages in 2020 since 2007. But that being said, we still have a lot of work to do. We still have at any moment 200 to 60 to 280 drugs, essential drugs that are short at any time in this country. So we still have a lot of work to do. But I think we're taking the right steps in building that resilient supply chain. I'll give you some examples. I think you know the report the FDA put out in 2019, late 2019 around drug shortages, I think was eye-opening. It was illuminating um, for many of us across this country around some of the struggles and issues that we've been seeing going on for decades. Uh, the FDA's recent essential medication report that's been released, and it, you know, again, Vizian's very much in favor of that. We, we developed one years ago as well because we think it's important that we all have our eyes on what are those life-saving acute and chronic drugs that can never go short. They can't go short. Um, you know, we now know data that we didn't have years ago around API manufacturing location. I'll, I'll tell you, Vizian, we require that. Uh, we require that now we need to know at all times where these products are being manufactured, where the API is coming from. Can't tell you how important and helpful that was during COVID um, when you started to see particular countries that were having embargoes or being shut down around where these life-saving essential meds are coming from. But, doc but to Dr. Schondelmeyer's point, we still have more work to do there. Some of the other materials beyond just API, even packaging, plastic containers, needle, saline, everything that goes into it are just as critical and important in knowing where that's coming from and having that data set. We did learn a lot from COVID. You know, I think a lot of big uh, ideas came up around investing in a national stockpile. You know, I'll tell you, busy it now, we are housing 80, we are requiring our manufacturers to have 83 million vials of life-saving drugs essentially on shore. Um, but we also learned that this is, the work is never done. I'll give you a great example during COVID uh, probably one of the number one drugs that we saw an increase in demand on, like Marta talked about, was propofol. Well, propofol historically comes in multiple dosage, multiple sizes of vials. And typically, your 20 ml, your smaller vial, is the number one drug of choice across the country. It's what's used all the time for outpatient procedures in and out. During COVID, though, we saw a large spike in propofol, but it wasn't on the 20 ml vial. It was on the 50 and the 100 ml vial which again, we're gonna be needed for patients that were gonna be on ventilators fighting against COVID. But how you prepare for that and how you experience that has to be a constant evolution as we try to build this resilient supply chain. So I think we're starting to get there. I think we're starting to get some of the information, but you know, I'd like to share today, I think the biggest data point that we still are missing and really need to get towards is around quality. So when you think about drug quality today, where every drug is, is, is graded kind of the same. Every drug that comes into the market today, a generic is a generic to a generic, um, but there's really no way in identifying, is there a, a higher quality pharmaceutical comparing those three examples? And even if you had that data and you were able to see it, what's the methodology to really fully assess that, both transparently and reliably? So you've had all the data in the world, how do you have a real complete assessment, a trusted assessment, on which you could grade one pharmaceutical generic sterile injectable to another. So again, I think quality is the biggest metric we need to continue to push on. And I would say that I think it's, it, we need to make sure we quantify the impact of it because I think when you hear quality a lot, you also hear tied to it cost. And that's where we gotta be very careful. I think we all want high quality, safe and effective medicines, but we don't want any unintended consequences that come solely, usually at the cost of one or two participants in the supply chain, which is the provider and the patient. And so being able to assess where investments are making a significant impact around producing higher quality pharmaceuticals, I think is so important. 
Again, I think we're making great progress. I can't thank the Duke team and the participants today. And we got to continue to all work together if we're going to find the right solutions uh, to beat drug shortages. So thank you, Marta. I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you, thank you so much, Dan. So if I could now turn it over to uh, Mike Levy for um, a few minutes of remarks. Thank you, Marta. So USP has been building trust in the quality of medicines for over 200 years. We were established in 1820 and we set standards for medicines as well as for foods and dietary supplements. Our standards, of which we have about 5,000, are used by over 22,000 manufacturers in 150 countries. And our pharmaceutical standards are enforced by the FDA. These include several standards across the supply chain, including for API and finished dose, naming, manufacturing, packaging, and distribution. We have a 20 plus year relationship with USAID uh, doing USAID funded programs, working with regulators and manufacturers to improve the quality of medicines. We also have a program in advanced manufacturing technologies, including continuous manufacturing to help ensure that the medicines made using this new paradigm are of quality. Today, however, I'll focus on the work related, on our work related to the supply chain resilience. It's generally agreed, as Dan mentioned, that stakeholders in the supply chain make trade-offs between price, supply chain resilience, and quality. Identifying supply chain vulnerabilities is important so that choices can be made on an informed and solid fact base. This information is also important to government agencies looking to target investments where needed to improve the supply chain resilience. We think a good way to improve the quality of information available about supply chain resiliency is to have an independent third party to take in all of this data, much of which is proprietary, and to identify potential points of failure and strategies for mitigation without needing to reveal confidential information. Asper's Strategic National Stockpile Supply Chain Control Center is an example of how this might work, but its scope is currently limited to the Strategic National Stockpile. It only covers a narrow number of pharmaceuticals and the upstream supply chain risk is not a focus. We think that we could expand or we should expand on this idea. We feel strongly that looking at the supply side as well as the demand side is critical. As stakeholders, including governments and others are prioritizing medicines for mitigative action, the supply side of the equation needs to be taken into account. Lists of essential medicines, whether from FDA, WHO or others can help to identify drugs for specific use cases that might experience demand surges because they may not have a therapeutic alternative or they may be essential in critical care. Most conversations that we've heard suggest that stakeholders are focusing on the demand side challenges, and we've not heard enough consideration on the supply side. One notable exception is Dr. Steven Schondemeyer, who spoke earlier, and Marta as well, who raised it in her introduction. As an example, we saw a shortage of propofol, which Dan mentioned, and it is made by about five manufacturers in the US, many of whom use the same API supplier. We also saw shortages of dexamethasone, but these shortages were not as severe as those experienced before propofol because dexamethasone supply chain has more built-in redundancies, including the fact that it has many manufacturers and the fact that it's available in oral and injectable formulations. Given the importance that we place on supply side factors, USP has a number of programs focused on the supply chain. These broad programs span standards, training, capability building, and advocacy across many aspects of the supply chain, including in promoting the use of pharmaceutical continuous manufacturing, which will be discussed later in this webinar. We've also invested heavily to create the USP Medicine Supply Map, which combines our data and external data to identify, characterize, and quantify risk in the upstream supply chain so stakeholders can take mitigative action. Based on the Medicine Supply Map, we built a model to develop a supply chain resiliency score for drug products validated against historic drug shortages. What we found is that supply side factors such as the economics of a drug, the level of competition it faces, and the history of quality failures associated with the product all drive drug shortages and can be quantified. These types of analyses are valuable to inform which drug supply chains to stress test to further balance possible acute demand surges against upstream supply chain risk. I'll end my introductory comments there. Thank you so much, uh, Mike. Uh, and if I could turn it over to Rena for a few minutes of remarks, and then we'll open up for a broader discussion uh, with the panelists. Rena? Thank you, Marta. And thank you, Duke team, for putting together a fantastic set of, um, of panels. So I was asked to make some comments on the economics of supply in this um, product space. Um, and I have really, uh, four comments. 
Um, the first is that it's really important to start with the end in mind. And just to pick up with, Mar with Marta's comment, but also with Dan's, that really we care about resiliency in two dimensions. The first is obviously ensuring adequate supply for needed products. But the second piece is also really important to make sure that, the, that these products are manufactured to meet very um, strict quality standards. Um, on quality, it's really important to understand that these are experienced goods largely. It is very hard to discern quality in the manufacturing and the consumption of these products at the bedside um, or at the point or other part, parts of the supply chain. Also, remember, manufacturers face incentives to cheat. That's actually why we have regulation that sits on top of these manufacturers to ensure that these products are adequately manufactured. The regulations certainly help correct this incentive. However, they also create an unintended consequence, which is that they essentially create a floor for quality as opposed to a ceiling. In other words, the manufacturers face incentives to meet that floor, to get over that bar, that bar for quality, but not really invest much more than that. Secondly, remember, these are firms that are intending to maximize revenue. Where we have seen shortages, but also significant quality deficits are largely in the generic space, not in the branded space. Branded manufacturers face incentives to have redundant supply. If, um, God forbid, these type of supply constraints occur. In the generic space, the vast majority of these products are actually very low revenue products for their manufacturers. In some work that I have done with Ernie Burnt, we found that the median um, molecule was generating less than half a million dollars in revenue for their manufacturer. So to be sure there are blockbuster generic products out there, um, but really all else equal, these manufacturers are facing pretty small margins on these products. They're looking for opportunities to maximize revenue. They're looking for opportunities to exit the market for low revenue products and search for higher revenue products given their existing manufacturer constraints. Um, the other thing that's really important is that the economics of manufacturing are very fragile now. Um, most manufacturers have moved to just-in-time manufacturing. They are reducing their labor costs by, uh, by offshoring. And they're also finding alternative ways to manufacture these products um, using other types of arrangements, including contract manufacturing capacity. This suggests that actually any metric that you have on actual number of manufacturers may be a little deceiving because many uh, manufacturers of the same product might actually be all outsourcing to one contract manufacturer. So instead of having many, you actually have one, deeming our supply chain even more fragile than the statistics might suggest. And then finally, just remember that these are very complex products. As Marta um, mentioned, there are these base ingredients, um, all of the other equipment that is needed to make these products, and finally, their fill and finish products. Well, we have pretty good statistics on the supply for fill and finish. We really don't know much about the base ingredients. Um, there's certainly no national database that we can look for for understanding um, those supply um, and, their, and their constraints. The other thing is that national statistics on the supply of these products and specifically where they're coming from are really hampered by transparency concerns. And I would say the number one concern is with all of these metrics is that none of them are volume adjusted. So when we say the vast majority of some products are manufactured in India or in China, we are actually counting manufacturers. We are not adjusting for the volume that's actually being supplied into the US market. If we adjust for supply, for volume of supply, our 
our um, understanding of uh, where these products are manufactured could actually be very different. Um, and then really just to end here, um, when we're thinking about these base ingredients, um, those manufacturers also face their own economic constraints and opportunities. Um, they're mostly commodity markets. They are very subject to uh, a variety of different types of games, which include holdup. But there are also other constraints, including trade, um, currency uh, considerations, export considerations, as we've seen with COVID, um, that are all clearly relevant for ensuring both the quality of these products that are coming into the US, but also ensuring um, adequate supply. With that, I'm gonna say thank you, Marta, and turn it over to um, our discussion. Thank you so much. Uh, so now we will have um, all panelists uh, join us on the screen and uh, for, for a discussion. If I could actually begin with a question and I will ask uh, the same question of all of you and just briefly to answer and then we can dig a little bit more deeply and perhaps we'll go in, in reverse order. So, uh, you know, a number of you have indicated that, uh, that uh, it's there are challenges in trying to map out the supply chain, that there are different use cases for the supply chain, um, and also have mentioned uh, the efforts um, that um, with the executive order. So let me actually ask uh, with the executive about the executive order. What will be the greatest challenge that you see facing those who will be assessing the resilience of the drug supply chain under the executive order? So thinking about what has to happen between now and February, knowing what you understand about what data is available and to whom, when HHS is being asked to pull together this really uh, comprehensive view of the um, supply chains, uh, what do you see will be the biggest challenge? So maybe I'll ask Rina first. Uh, again, we really, um, we have very limited insight into API manufacturing and even more limited um, insight into the equipment required. So stoppers and vials and those type of things. Um, and, so, and there really isn't any data set that I am aware of that could provide a full purview, which would also again, adjust for market share or volume. Um, I think uh, the only other thing I would say here is that uh, we really don't know about quality. So even if we could count number of manufacturers that it would be volume adjusted, well, not all manufacturers are the same um, with vials or any of these other, um, these other products. Great, thank you. And uh, Michael, what are your thoughts on that? You can agree, sure. you can add, you can disagree. <laughs> so I think, I mean, I think great, the great fragmentation of the data is one of the key challenges. Um, and we are clearly missing a lot of information, a lot of data around key raw materials or key starting materials. That's really important. Um, but I do think that there's actually more information out there than I think folks realize. And, it, and piecing it together, stitching it together is a ton of work, but if you do, you actually get some pretty relevant and pretty interesting insights. So while I don't disagree with Rena's assertion, I do think that there's a large investment in just using the data that's already there and uh, combining it with maybe some other sources uh, to drive value. And that, that's what we've tried to do in the medicine supply map. So I will be coming, uh, coming back to you, Michael, um, in a second with a question related to that. So um, if I could turn uh, the same, ask the same question of Dan. Yeah, I, I would agree with my fellow panelists. I think the sheer vastness of the supply chain itself, I mean, the, you mentioned it, Mario, the multiple components. Some of our worst drug shortages have been due to glass. They've been, they've been due to packaging. I mean, again, the vastness of it. I think also how they define resilience in their eyes. So again, I think, uh, I think the focus on onshore, nearshore manufacturing, extremely important. I think all of us support that. But I, that's not the definition of resiliency, right? Some of our worst drug shortages have been caused by manufacturing plants that are in the United States. So I think just making sure we're having the full picture on how we define resilience is really important. Stephen, what about you? And let's see, test your um, audio to see whether we can hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Excellent. 
So uh, many good points raised already. I would say probably one of the biggest challenges is, is the resilience of the drug resilience supply map. Uh, that is, this is constantly changing. Even if we can take a one uh, point in time snapshot and have that supply map, and we are working uh, at Minnesota on doing volume and, and expenditure indexing of those things at the NDC level, even if we have that, it's constantly changing. And so resilience of the supply map and keeping it up to date and relevant is also a challenge. So let me actually now go back, thank you, Stephen, uh, to, to Mike. So let me ask you about some of the data that USP um, has. How can uh, USP be contributing to painting this broader picture? You have a big effort going on and who are the right partners to help pull together this really comprehensive picture? Um, if, you could, if you could talk to that a little bit. Sure, absolutely. So on, um, on the supply side, which is where we, where we focus, uh, we have, um, I, I didn't mention this in my introduction, but we have offices basically in those places where medicines are made. And so we have great on ground presence and a, a pretty good intelligence of what's, what's happening in those various locations, combined with uh, the fact that we, we produce those standards that are used to ensure the quality of those medicines. And that gives us some insight into um, actual production. And so when we combine that with the data that lots of other people have access to, um, you know, on whether it's from the FDA, as, as Dr. Schonemeyer mentioned, or, or others, and we bring it all together, we actually get a, 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 it's not perfect, we know it's not perfect, but we get a pretty holistic map of the medicine supply map of the US. Um, and that, so it would be great to uh, continue our work, you know, try to augment that maybe as I said, establish a third party that can have access to some more proprietary information and be able to leverage that differently, but also partner with folks who have much better visibility on the demand side. And then we can sort of look for mismatches between supply and demand. So actually, let me ask a, a, a similar question of, of, of Dan, or actually a flip side of the question. So to what extent uh, do you see the phase two uh, executive order help Visient, uh, Visient's efforts to map uh, supply chains. You've talked to the difficulties in being able to obtain certain type of information. Do you see that uh, being helpful to your efforts? Yeah, I, I think we're very hopeful about it, Marta. I mean, again, we, we don't know the extent at which we'll be able to see, but it, around the data and the information is there. If it could be given to stakeholders like Visient, it could be very helpful. You know, we talk about the source location, some of the data we collect today and confirmation of, if it delves in deeper into quality, I think that could be very helpful, but it seems that it's gonna have some other various manufacturing metrics. You know, when you think about workforce, when you think about facilities, research, development, that would very much help address the ability around how we can define resiliency and how we can, as stakeholders in the industry, uh, again, drive towards safe and effective and high quality pharmaceuticals. So very hopeful. Uh, but obviously, you know, more to be seen when we go through the details and, and are privy to that. Uh, th thanks, Dan. And, and Stephen, a similar question. Uh, you know, can you speak a little bit more to the uh, Resilient Drug Supply Chain Project and how this could map and help support uh, or, or help complement uh, some of the efforts or can inform actually some of the uh, efforts to map this uh, broad uh, effort to map supply chains? Sure. I think historically, many of our shortages have been individual products or a company that went out of business, so others had to make up the difference and we had a shortage. But we're beginning to see shortages that are kind of market-wide that cut across the market. Think about the Valsartan recalls that we had. Most Valsartans were recalled from the market, not just one manufacturer or two. And then ranitidine, we had with the NDMA contamination that occurred, we had all virtually all ranitidine removed from the market. And we're seeing a similar pattern with metformin. So first we're seeing kind of market-wide impacts or insults that are causing shortages. I, I would say also, we may not be out of the weeds yet with the COVID-19 uh, and shortages, particularly because of uh, the vaccine itself. On the one hand, you know, we're all ecstatic that we have vaccines that work and they're being distributed but it's been apparent that we haven't been able to produce as much as we need, as quick as we need and get it out there and distributed. And um, we essentially went from a demand of zero to a global universal demand for this product and needing billions and billions of doses. 
And again, the market has adapted fairly well to produce many of them, but there's still shortages in supply. And those places that are making the vaccine right now are bumping other products. I think we'll see a secondary wave of products that have been bumped, either other low volume vaccines like yellow fever or dengue fever, or other things that might come in short supply or other sterile injectables that could have been made on the same line that might be bumped because of the extreme demand of COVID-19. So we may have secondary, and those are things that an individual uh, uh, stakeholder may not see looking upstream, but someone looking across the whole market as we're trying to do at our Minnesota model, and we could do with a government agency of some type, looking across the mar market can identify these market-wide uh, demand problems. Thank you. And uh, if I can actually turn to Rena instead of me asking a question, there are uh, a number of interesting questions in the chat that perhaps uh, that were posed in the Q&A uh, by, the by uh, members of the audience. And, and Rena, I think you wanted to address um, some of them. If so, I, I will turn it to you. Yeah, thank you. So uh, the first is um, uh, that other countries do have transparency over API manufacturing. And so the question is, why doesn't the US? And the general uh, response has been that the companies themselves view this as a trade secret. They do tell the FDA where they are manufacturing um, and sourcing uh, base ingredients. But again, that is not volume linked in any way. Um, and the FDA has generally agreed with the manufacturers that that information um, will, uh, will remain private. I will tell you <laughs> that I have tried to FOIA that information. It is possible, but it is actually quite, quite difficult to do. Um, the other comment that people have made is, well, you know, why not uh, just invest in API manufacturing in the US? Um, and I, I suspect that we'll get back uh, into that comment um, on, the, on the third session, but um, it's not obvious that US manufacturing uh, can accommodate the API manufacturing, um, particularly in the time periods that would be needed to really release some of this pressure. Um, it is both cost prohibitive, but also it's not, uh, we, we have some environmental constraints in manufacturing that would prohibit some of the more uh, important products to be onshore. Thank you, Rena. And actually, um, Rena will join the third session when we're going to be talking about next steps. And I expect that this information is going to come up again. How do we prioritize what happens next? Uh, the only other thing I wanted to add around what information is available, it's not that um, API manufacturer um, is frequently not known, but even for the finished dosage form product, if the product is contract manufactured, it is also considered uh, business confidential information and frequently not disclosed. So when uh, Dan is trying to figure out who is really manufacturing and where the products are being manufactured, um, he uh, cannot just uh, find that information uh, he, unless the manufacturers actually, um, the, the, the company that actually sells the product can share that information. So with that, I would like to, we, we could uh, spend uh, another hour talking about the state of the uh, drug supply chain resilience and what information is and is not available, but we'll have to uh, end right now. And I will turn it over to Adam Kretsch, uh, who is going to have a session discussing uh, what are some of the ways that we can improve the resilience of the drug supply chain before we then talk about what are the next steps. So thank you very much. And thank you to all the panelists. Thanks and thank you, Marta. So, so as Marta mentioned, uh, our panelists in that first session just considered how we define and how we assess supply chain resilience. So in this section, session, we wanna think a little bit more about some of the specific steps that we can take to strengthen the resilience of our supply chain. So it so happens that all of our panelists during this session represent organizations that have made significant investments and taken practical steps to improve the resilience of our supply chain. So I'm really looking forward to getting their perspectives on how we can actually accomplish this. Uh, so with that, I'll introduce our panelists for today. We have uh, Sandeep Patel, Director of the Division of Research, Innovation and Ventures, or DRIVE, at BARDA. 
Uh, we have Bill Falstich, Vice President for Biopharma Hospital Supply at Pfizer, and Alan Cockle, Senior Vice President of Public Policy at Civica. Um, so we're going to ask each of them to share a few minutes of opening remarks, as we did in our last session. And, and let's start with Sandeep. Sandeep, are you there? Yep, I'm here. Can you Great. guys hear me? Can hear you well. Cool. All right. Thanks, Adam. Um, and thanks for this awesome event. So uh, I think the well, let me start by saying that I work for for BARDA, the Biomedical Advanced Research and Development Authority. And for those of you not familiar with BARDA, we're we're a group within uh, the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services (HHS) that's tasked with developing life-saving novel medical countermeasures in the context of public health emergencies like COVID-19. Um, uh, BARDA has sort of prides itself on on working with its partners to get, I think, now 60 products through through FDA licensure and and is obviously heavily over the last 12 months, heavily focused on, on getting COVID vaccines, therapeutics, diagnostics, and other related technologies to, to people. Um, my job, however, uh, uh, within DRIVE, our, our innovation unit, is to sort of peer into the future and, and think and, and try to think about what technologies and innovation uh, might, uh, might be there to, to potentially impact issues like supply chain resilience that, that, that we're talking about today. And the question that I like kind of ask myself and think about quite a bit, um, which is one that we've been discussing, which is how do we how do we develop a system where where we can handle these demand and supply shocks, as Marta was mentioning, but also the variances in supply and demand across different medical products, um, um, especially you know in cases where you might need just small amounts of uh, uh, of, uh, of a drug in a very rare situation, for example. Um, and, and, and I think put, put in context real quick, I think there's a couple of macro trends to keep in mind in the healthcare system. So I think clearly we're, we're moving towards a more personalized precision medicine system and paradigm um, and, and increasing use of biologics as therapeutics. Um, so that's important to note when it comes to resilience. The second is that we're, we're, we're increasingly uh, distributed in, in sort of the sites of care, right? So care doesn't just happen at hospitals anymore and it's increasingly distributed to other settings like homes or retail clinics and things like that. Um, and I think two ideas sort of emerge for me in terms of innovation in the future out of this. One is that I think manufacturing needs to be closer to the patient. You know, we're gonna have these situations where we're gonna need to develop personalized cocktails, personalized biologics. And the closer we are in terms of manufacturing design to the patient, the, the more resilient you're gonna, you're gonna um, and the more practical the, the situation is gonna be. Um, and that sort of speaks to a, a decentralized uh, approach to manufacturing uh, into the future. And I think the second is that, you know, we have to come up with ways, better ways to scale, but also descale more easily, right? So it's not just about adding capacity, it's about taking down capacity when you no longer need it quickly so it can be moved to, to other uses. Um, um, and so, you know, this sort of speaks to a few sort of approaches, and I'll, I'll break it down into two quick kind of categories. One is, you know, clearly we need some innovation in advanced manufacturing. Um, so it's been alluded, but things like continuous on-demand uh, modular manufacturing. So imagine having a distributed set of, uh, of very miniaturized units where you can manufacture small molecules, you can measure, measure, uh, manufacture biologics uh, on-demand, customized, so you can, you can either anticipate or respond to, to very fast-changing environments and needs. Um, and a lot of this is going to rest on, on innovations in sort of enabling technologies, uh, things like inline sensors to ensure quality, which has been, been alluded to also uh, in the discussions. Um, things like cost are going to become an issue when you get to, into these more decentralized approaches. And so, so there's a tremendous amount of opportunity to, to, to think and, and sort of advance some of these approaches. Um, uh, it also gets this, into this uh, away from the stockpiling paradigm. Uh, which is the typical has been the paradigm for for a number of a uh, few decades now, which is manufacture a bunch of drugs and put them in a stockpile until you need them. So, but in situations like, for example, a chemical exposure attack, when you need very rapidly within minutes, you know, a, a, a drug, you know, this situation doesn't necessarily uh, uh, design for that, and so you run into issues with with getting it to the right people at the right time. So. So clearly there's, there's an opportunity to kind of rethink this paradigm. The second piece is how do we, how do we redesign the medical product itself um, uh, to be more resilient? So I'll give you a couple examples. So one is, is opportunities around drug repurposing. So instead of developing novel drugs that require its own manufacturing and its own supply chain and distribution chain, can we better take advantage of drugs that are already easily available to a vast number of people, you know, noting the the, the general supply chain resilience issues, uh, but but still to to 
you know, instead of developing novel drugs, can we just repurpose where possible drugs for, for new indications that we think are important? So this is something that we started a program with Barda to look at this for events like chemical exposure, a program called Redirect. Um, the second piece real quick is to, is to think about the modes of administration. Um, and this to me is really important because this gets into orthogonal, orth, ortho, uh, ortho, uh, orthogonal issues around around supply chain. So, give you the example of uh, of vaccine delivery. Um, you know, a lot of the supply constraint con chain constraints are related to the ancillary supplies, so vials, needles, syringes. Um, and so, imagine if we had an alternative mode of delivery for vaccines, something like a micro needle patch. Um, not only does that make it easier to deliver the vaccine and, and create uh, uh, more flexible ways to, to do that, but it also creates orthogonality in the supply chain uh, and creating some more resilience and being able to do things like, you know, vaccinate the globe within a short period of time. So, so I think there's a tremendous amount of opportunities on the innovation side that I think could address a lot of these issues. Um, I'll pause here because I know we're getting to, to other panelists and discussions. So thanks. All right. And thank you, Cindy. Um, so next up, we have Bill Falstich. Thanks, Adam, and and thanks for having uh, thanks for having me on. It's a pleasure to be here. I think it's such a timely topic with all the the things that are going on in the world right now. So appreciate Duke Margolis uh, putting this on and you know, giving me a chance to represent a, a manufacturer's sort of perspective on on supply chain resilience. And I will say, and you can see the picture up on the screen, resilience has been a, a focus at Pfizer for for quite a long time. We know when when drugs are in shortage, what that can mean to supply chains and what it can mean to patients, right? That there can be delays in, in, in the administration of medicine, healthcare practitioners might need to you know, create alternate therapies, and just in general, there's overall cost to the system. So we've, we've had a, you know, significant investments and, and focus underway for many years around supply chain resilience. And I do think reflecting on the past 12 to 18 months, that work has been foundational in some of the successes that we've had, like the one you see here on the screen, which is all around our, our vaccine. And as noted earlier, it's, it's a complex supply chain. So you see a picture of uh, the manufacturing fill line on there, but you also see our labs. You see at the top left um, our, our logistics centers packing out the vaccine to be shipped uh, you know, to, to point of use. So very complex supply chain. But I do think the, the resilience and the investments that we've made around resilience have enabled us to scale up production of, of the vaccine at you know, quite a rapid pace and also to support some of the, the medicines referenced earlier that are used in, in critical care settings. So very proud of the work that's been done. As uh, I think it was might have been Dane Kistner referenced earlier, the work is never really done in this space. We've, we've made very good progress. I think other manufacturers have done the same, but the work continues and it, it will never end. It's, it's an evolving effort. So what, what I'd like to do in the next couple minutes is just talk about um, a few of the sort of multifaceted focus areas that, that I think are, are really critical from a manufacturer standpoint to building supply chain resilience. And I'll talk first about a couple that are more internal to the manufacturing firm. And then I'll go a bit broader, maybe more policy oriented around in the larger supply chain space, some other concepts that we think are very important around, around supply chain resilience. So let me start first with, um, within any manufacturer, that this notion of risk management um, and risk remediation. And I, you know, I think any manufacturer that's in this sort of business needs a program in place around assessing the risk they have within their supply chain and addressing it. And this could be a lot of the attributes that were, were discussed earlier. It could be things like capacity utilization. Is there redundancy in the supply chain? Is there process robustness? Do we have risks around procured materials or regulatory change uh, or any other number of macro level risks? There's, there's many that are out there. And what I would hope manufacturers are doing and should be thinking about are putting in place a, a system that in a comprehensive fashion looks at these risks and where the risks are identified, they're addressed in some manner. And it, it, could, be, it could be through inventory, it could be through additional re redundancy, it could be investment in, in CapEx, modernization, and so on. 
uh, a number of ways that, that it could be addressed. But I think the important thing is every manufacturer and, and in reality, every participant in the supply chain should have some methodology that they use on an ongoing basis to assess risk and, uh, and address it. The second element that I wanted to, to spend just a minute on within um, and reflect on the work we've done within Pfizer is the role that technology has to play. So anyone that builds a supply chain has some notion of what the design of the supply chain should be, right? How, how much product should I be able to make in a given time period? How long should it take me to release? What will my demand look like? How much inventory do I want to have at each point in my supply chain? And there's the, those design characteristics. And then there, you need to understand what actually occurs. Do you have the inventory you expect? Is your demand as you anticipate it would be? Are your sites operating in the way you want them to operate? And what we've seen, especially over the past few years, is with technological advance, it's, it's become much easier to monitor actual performance against those design parameters in real time. And so we're able to react more quickly to address issues when a, a crisis might come up, whether it's a hurricane, whether it's a pandemic, manufacturers are able to, to really understand what the situation is and adapt and react more quickly. So I think the role that technology has to play within a manufacturing environment is, is very critical and can add a lot of benefit, reduce risk in the, in the supply chain. And if you extend it and, and consider across enterprises, does technology have a, a similar role to play? I think that the answer is, is almost certainly yes. So before I pivot, I, I do want to chat a little bit about the external environment, but I, I would just add I, the things I just discussed, first of all, it's not an all-inclusive list. I picked out a couple of the most what I thought were, were important ones, but I don't think this is exclusive to Pfizer. I, I think we've seen in the past, whether it is dealing with the aftermath of, of hurricanes, of earthquakes, of the current pandemic, we have seen manufacturers respond well. We have seen continuity of supply maintained, and I'm sure that that has to do in part with, with some of the aspects I, I talked about. So I don't think it's just Pfizer-specific, although I'm sure every manufacturer continues to do more and, and, and will improve. Um, I'll just pivot and talk for a couple minutes about the external environment because it's, it, it, there's only so much that a manufacturer can do within its firm, but there's, there's certain things within the environment that also help, in my view, uh, improve supply chain resilience. And I'll start with the idea of free, free movement of goods and supply across borders. Um, earlier on in the presentation, there was a, a slide put up that illustrated all the components and materials and, um, and equipment that comes together to make a, a pharmaceutical supply chain. It's very broad, very geographically diverse, typically, the supply chain. And a lot of the components and the materials are highly specialized. And so part of maintaining resilient supply chains is enabling those materials to flow freely across borders to the place that they're needed most. And so it's important that we think about policy considerations that promote free movement of goods across borders. A second aspect I would highlight would just be around modern manufacturing equipment and modern manufacturing networks. Uh, we, we all know intuitively, and we certainly see it here at Pfizer, that modern equipment is more reliable, it works more effectively, and it delivers better outcomes um, in, in terms of predictable uh, and sustainable supply. And because the, the equipment is so specialized in a, in a pharmaceutical manufacturing environment and it's just continually adapting, it's important that manufacturers routinely reinvest to modernize in their, in their manufacturing networks. And it, it's probably a good idea to think about policies that incentivize that sort of behavior in a manufacturer, that incentivize that ongoing modernization. And then the final point I would just make, and I'll, I'll shift a little bit to the marketplace, and this has been alluded to a couple times by, by prior speakers as well, but typically as a manufacturer, it, what makes investment 
uh, and resilience work most effectively is predictable supply, predictable contract terms um, where demand is known for a long period of time uh, and it's at a, a stable price. And paradoxically, in some supply chains, that tends not to be the case. We tend to see a very commoditized supply chain where volumes are, are not fixed. They can come and go very quickly, as can prices. And so it, that race to the bottom makes it very difficult for manufacturers to invest, to modernize, to maintain flexible capacity, and so on. Uh, I know here at Pfizer, and, and I know others within the industry as well, are working to create contractual agreements that enable sustainable pricing and sustainable long-term demand and volume commitments, and we certainly support that as well. I think that's a big part of, of creating resilience within the supply chain. So with that said, I'll, I'll, I'll turn it over to the next speaker, and just, again, thanks for having me, and looking forward to the panel discussion to come. All right. Thank you, Bill. And that, that's a terrific segue to our, our, our third and final speaker, Alan Cockle. So, Alan, are you there? Oh, it looks like you're on mute. You would think after a year we would know how to go off, off mute, but here we are. Thanks. It's good to be with you um, and good to be on a, a set of panels with some fellow pharmacists today. Um, so, as others have said, there's really two problems that we're solving for here. One is the peacetime supply chain have a supply chain that doesn't fail us under ordinary circumstances, and, and we don't have that now. And then the other is a supply chain that's resilient in the face of a shock, whether that's a, a global surge in demand due to a public health emergency like a pandemic or, or another disruption uh, like a natural disaster or, or even a, a trade dispute in the future. But let me talk a little bit about Civica because we were an organization really created with a mission around supply chain resiliency, and then turn quickly to some broader uh, things that would help with supply chain resiliency. So Civica was created to uh, mitigate drug shortages. We were established by US hospitals and by three philanthropies as a nonprofit generic drug company. And today we serve uh, more than 50 health systems accounting for about one in three uh, licensed hospital beds in the US. And we're delivering 41 drugs now on track to reach hundred in the not too distant future. Um, mostly sterile injectable products. Um, and part of our model to a, a point that Bill Falsich just made is that our hospital members, uh, they prioritize the drugs that uh, they want us to make or source. So it's not the ones that have the high return. It's the ones that are in shortage or they're having trouble obtaining. Uh, and then we make them and, and when we enter the market, they make a long-term uh, purchase commitment so that we know and, and our suppliers know that uh, we will be there uh, for uh, years to come. Um, right now we are uh, distributing, um, uh, as I said, 41 drugs through uh, private label distribution from existing ANDA holders, uh, but we're also developing our own ANDAs to be manufactured either at contract manufacturers or at our own sterile injectable facility that's under uh, construction now, uh, in part uh, funded through a contract with BARDA. And there are a number of things about our model that are uh, different, including um, uh, the maintenance of a safety stock. So when we're um, making or distributing a drug, we maintain a physical reserve of several months supply of that product so that if there's an increase in demand or an interruption in supply, we can continue to supply our hospitals. Um, in addition, we have a, a very robust process of um, uh, supplier qualification and uh, redundancy in suppliers whenever possible. Uh, and we have a focus on sourcing drugs uh, from US manufacturers whenever possible or from other highly regulated economies and uh, a no China policy in our supply chain uh, unless it's absolutely unavoidable. And, and we can talk a little more about that. Um, so as we've said, the the supply chain, as others have said, uh, has, has not been healthy, the generic drug supply chain for more than a decade now, um, notwithstanding the astonishing uh, technological achievement of delivering tens of thousands of SKUs uh, on a just-in-time basis to points of care all over the world, we have at any given time hundreds of products that are in shortage. 
And supply is inelastic and, and notwithstanding some of the new technologies that have been mentioned, it will continue to be so uh, for the foreseeable future. So if you have to build a new facility and develop a new ANDA, um, that can take probably 36 months. Uh, transferring an existing ANDA to an existing but, but new uh, facility, getting a qualification there is probably nine months. And even a, a best case scenario where you're producing under an existing ANDA in a currently approved facility where you have to start production there and, and, and produce a, a new batch off, off schedule, uh, you're looking at at least three months. Um, so one thing that as we think through resiliency, we really should think about um, the fact that nobody right now has an incentive to keep extra inventory on hand. In fact, quite the opposite. And it's the reason that supply chains, not just in drugs, but all, all over the world have gone to just in time inventory. Um, but we, we, we really do need to have uh, inventory to buffer uh, supply shocks and to allow additional capacity to come online. Um, that won't be free. Um, it will add cost. We'll either have to pay manufacturers or others in the system to keep that inventory or expect that it would be passed through uh, into prices because it, it can't come out of the company margins in, in the generic drug space. Um, so if we were to require companies to um, keep six months of supply on hand, um, the U.S. spends, let's say, $100 billion uh, a year on generic drugs back of the envelope at sort of a 10% cost of capital, that might cost us $10 billion a year. Maybe we don't wanna do it for all generic drugs, but we should think about starting with some of the essential medicines list that the FDA and, and others have been uh, developing. Um, what else can we do? So new technologies, um, there was a question in the comments about the cost of producing API in the US. One technology that has been talked about for a long time is continuous manufacturing that has the potential to be more efficient, uh, more nimble, more environmentally friendly, and by some estimates, bring down the cost of API production by about a third. And, and that's something that um, hasn't been extensively adopted yet in the generic drug space in, in particular. Um, we do think that uh, a focus on domestic manufacturing makes sense for two reasons. One is we can uh, oversee, uh, ensure uh, quality in, in the US uh, uh, and in, in markets where we have uh, insight into the, into the facilities. But the other is, as we've seen in the pandemic, when there's a global surge in demand for these products, uh, countries are going to understandably uh, reserve product to serve their own populations first. And there are drugs and in entire categories of drugs that we simply don't make in the US, either active ingredient or finished drug at this stage. Others have talked about our, the need for better insight into quality. Uh, FDA has been working for some time on transparent quality metrics or quality maturity ratings. Uh, and it would be uh, extremely useful if the FDA were to roll that out and ultimately companies were uh, required or incentivized to participate in that so that purchasers had a way to know not just is this uh, coming from an FDA approved facility, but is this a company that really takes quality seriously, that has a culture of quality that's very serious about investigating and fixing deviations and so on. Um, and then uh, ensuring a redundancy, not just for manufacturers, but also purchasers, as long as we have a supply chain that um, functions as a commodity market that lets uh, us depend uh, entirely or the lion's share on a single manufacturer, we will be vulnerable. So really thinking about how do we ensure uh, diversity of suppliers and, and diversity of geography in that supply. So those are all things we can do to increase the, the resiliency of the supply chain. Thank you. All right, thank you, Alan. And, um, and we only have a few minutes left for, for some discussion, but I think that uh, you all raised some really great and important points. Um, so, so why don't we start with a question for all of you? Um, and, and just echoing off of some of the different ideas I heard, um, you know, it's, it seems like one of the critical themes here is that supply chain resilience is really about the, is in part about the ability for us to be able to respond quickly to supply shocks. And that can come anything from a shortage of a, of a, a drug that's needed, a personalized medicine for a small number of patients, 
or a pandemic in which you need to scale up and be able to produce massively globally. Um, how do we think about what are the most critical and important tools and technologies that we might have at our disposal that could really help us improve our responsiveness? I mean, is there anything that we can get do to get down from that, you know, six to nine months uh, to get a new facility going with a new product um, and, and reduce that number? And what does it take to actually get, get those tools and technologies adopted? And we've heard about continuous manufacturing for a long time. Uh, and yet we haven't seen as much uptake of it as we might have, we might like. So, so question for all of you, and why don't we start with Sandeep? Yeah, um, I guess just a couple quick points on that. So one is I think um, uh, clearly, you know, we need some, some large investments and, and commitment to things like continuous manufacturing. I think, I think part of the struggle, at least in my opinion, is finding the right set of initial use cases for, for which clearly there would be added value in, in that kind of an approach. Um, so I think, I think there's some opportunity to kind of figure out sort of the pathway there uh, on that. I think in terms of uh, biggest bang for buck, I think this was mentioned earlier and I can't remember from who, but I think to the extent that we can actually predict in silico or uh, simulate scenarios and, and be able to know ahead of time, you know, what are the, what are mitigation factors? So for example, like, you know, if there's a if there's a shock in one one you know drug, what is that? What is that gonna? How's that gonna impact other situations? And we can model these things, right? And I think that'll improve our ability to kind of respond um, better. Great, thanks. And and Bill, I'm curious on your thoughts on this, uh, especially with with the challenges uh, that we've seen in actually getting some of these new approaches adopted. And and what 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 do, what do you look at when you're assessing uh, some of these yeah. new approaches? Yeah, I think it, so. It's it, it, as usual, right? I think it's a multitude of things, and I, I, up front, it's in part understanding the marketplace. And as Sandeep said, it, um, what does the competitive landscape look like, and what what sort of market share dynamics are in place? If the if we have a demand issue in one or a supply issue in one molecule, where might that demand flow? So I think getting better understanding of that first and foremost can help someone like like a manufacturer to to put its inventory in the right place, to hold reserve manufacturing capacity in the right place and and so on. When you have an issue that hits, there's it's sort of without a doubt that inventory is the first buffer that you can use. So thinking about what what demand might look like and what the volatility of both demand and supply or even upstream material availability might be and holding strategic inventory is is quite honest, honestly the I would say the simplest sort of mechanism you can use and, and the quickest to realization. Of course, that only lasts for so long, and then you do need, if nothing else, reserve capacity or some redundancy where you can shift across across products. And I think typically that's what um, you know we've seen work well in terms of technology investment. I think it's very situational. We do some continuous manufacturing technology. I think it needs to be obviously suited to the to the portfolio that that a company has. It needs to be the right um, investment for the right supply chain, and every supply chain is a little bit different. So it's um, conceptually, I I think there's opportunities there, but it's I think it's a bit hard on a blanket sort of from a blanket perspective to say it should be this or that because I find it to be very situational by by supply chain. Thanks. And Alan, any thoughts? Yeah, I, I think, um, first of all, the, the potential of, of continuous manufacturing, it's absolutely true that that only applies to certain molecules. So it's suited to small molecules. Uh, any, for example, drug that's derived from uh, a living organism, whether that's heparin from uh, you know, a porcine source or uh, penicillins or cephalosporins that are derived from fermentation are, are not going to be suited to continuous manufacturing. But the question of, of how do we get more investment in that technology, I think is, is really a, a subset of the larger question of, of how do we create a market where in the generic drug space where manufacturers have an incentive to keep investing in manufacturing and, and in new plants and, and updated filling equipment and so on. And, and as we've said right now, if, if you're not sure you're going to have a market share in, in five years, uh, there's, uh, it's pretty hard to justify building a new plant. Uh, and, and so really creating that uh, market where there is a stable and predictable demand and price 
uh, for that matter, would create uh, a situation where companies could really think in the long term about some of these investments. Thanks, Alan. And I think with that, uh, we are about out of time, but, but appreciate uh, all of your contributions to this conversation, really important ideas to carry forward. And I think we'll be carrying them forward right into our next and final session. So I'll turn that over to Mark to introduce our next panel. Great. Uh, thank you very much, Adam. And thanks to all of our panelists. Uh, now we're going to move on to our third panel for the day. This is our concluding discussion focusing on steps that the federal government can take in the near future, maybe in the longer term, to help us move toward a more resilient and responsive supply chain, exactly as we've been discussing in our previous sessions. So as we talked about at the beginning, there is a lot of congressional interest in this, a lot of steps that the administration is taking to try to gather evidence and, and, and maybe take some uh, initial steps forward. What we'd like to do now is talk about where we go from here uh, in the coming weeks, coming months, uh, into 2022. And very pleased to have a distinguished panel with us here as well. Well, uh, Doug holtz -Eakin is the president of the American Action Forum. Uh, Carlo de Notaris Stefani is the president of CDN Advising and working in this space for a long time. Uh, Jessica Daly, vice president for uh, strategic supplier engagement at Premier. And uh, Rena Conti. Rena, glad to have you back with us now. Uh, as I uh, mentioned earlier, she's associate research director at the Institute for Health System Innovation and Policy at Boston University. So we're going to start out again with some brief opening remarks, uh, hopefully building on what you've heard already from each of our panelists, and then we'll go to some discussion. If you all do have questions, Questions or suggestions for how to move forward, uh, please put them in the Q&A box. Uh, Doug, uh, let me start with you. Oh, well, thanks, Mark, and, and thanks to the Duke team for the chance to be here today and everyone for, for participating. Um, you know, I, I think uh, a couple of things jump out at me, and I think first and foremost, if you think of it from a congressional point of view, the first step is to, be, is to carefully define what is the public policy problem. Mm -hmm. We've heard that uh, Manufacturers have a great interest in having uh, an efficient, resilient supply chain. Uh, industry stakeholders have lots of reasons to, to participate in efforts to do that. We've, we see examples of that. So what is left over that is uniquely suited to the federal government and what can it provide in the way of additional resilience with the appropriate data incentives and the like? That, that's sort of the first step. And there are at least four interrelated concepts that keep floating through here. It's worth sort of deciding which one you're worried about. Are you worried about responses to disruptions like pandemic, earthquakes, hurricanes, things like that? Uh, are you worried about um, uh, the sort of notion of uh, needing to innovate rapidly, as in the case of developing a vaccine, you know, sort of getting something novel and, and getting it to scale, the appropriate scale quickly? What, what do you have to do that? Uh, or are you worried about new geopolitical developments? We are not fond of China and need to uh, rethink our strategies in light of this uh, geopolitical reality. Or fourth one that's come up, uh, is there something that seems to be chronically wrong that leads to a shortage of, uh, say, generic drugs over long periods of time? Those, those are four interrelated but distinct issues that have arisen during the discussion. And, and in thinking about a congressional response, try to be real clear about which one uh, you're, you're trying to solve, because they're not all uh, the same solutions. So, Second thing I, 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 at least I personally would benefit from, so this is the selfish part of the remarks, uh, we've done this before in my lifetime. Uh, after September 11th, 2001, uh, we decided that we needed to have uh, medical countermeasures for uh, bi uh, weaponized uh, anthrax and other bioweapons. Uh, we decided that the federal government should invest taxpayer dollars into surge capacity to produce such things in, in circumstances. And I think a lessons learned uh, um, uh, crawl through that history would be a good thing to do. What did and did not work? Um, where were taxpayer dollars used effectively? And where, where did we simply uh, end up not getting much of a return on them? And, and I, I, I didn't follow that closely enough to know the answer to all of Project BioShield and, and, and what it produced and didn't produce. But I think uh, this kind of a group, that, that'd be a good uh, sort of uh, lesson. Uh, in terms of things to prioritize in a strategy, I mean, it, it first and foremost comes through the real need for better information. Um, and uh, information collection dissemination is, is in the end, one of the ultimate public goods that the government is uniquely positioned to, to provide. And this seems like a, a priority here uh, as well. Uh, the second thing that I, I at least think would be really uh, beneficial is to, to focus on the notion of stress tests, identify uh, those, those drugs that, that are of high priority to have in continuous supply and uh, present a scenario of, uh, of physical disruptions, uh, of geopolitical disruptions, of uh, pandemics, 
and see how companies can, can, uh, can continue to supply them. Or if they're not going to, how long will they be down? What does it take to restart? Uh, and, and use those stress tests in the same way we use the financial stress tests in the aftermath of the financial crisis to build a much more resilient financial system today than we had 15 years ago. And, and that's been a, an enormous success. I think the same kind of thing could work here. Uh, third piece of strategy is, is I would have everything be outcome-based, right? It, 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 it serves two purposes. First of all, you don't just get the taxpayer's money and, and don't produce anything with it. Uh, that's one of my concerns about sort of broad tax breaks and things that just um, uh, give an incentive, but don't say, take that incentive and produce an outcome. So have outcome-based strategies where you measure those outcomes. As you measure outcomes, it forces you to ask yourself, what exactly am I asking them for? And that gets back to my first point, which is let's identify the problem we're, we're, we're trying to solve. And, and I think those tend to, to go hand in hand. And so um, I think those are important. Uh, the, the last thing I'd say is um, I, I, there are always gonna be trade-offs in these things. And I, and I think uh, the discussion just highlighted one of them. There is this tremendous interest right now in having everything in the United States. That's an expensive strategy. And, and uh, a different strategy is one that says, well, we want to have the free flow of inputs across borders, uh, even in periods of, of disruption. And, and those, those two uh, involve trade-offs, and, and they also imply that you have to have your strategies for resilient supply chains in drugs and elsewhere linked up with your strategies on trade and your strategies on, on antitrust and, and uh, other things that the federal government is doing. And it's important not to pretend this is operating in a silo because you may end up uh, uh, trying to do something that is just uh, hamstrung by other efforts. So uh, I'll stop there so we have time for discussion, Mark. Thank you for the chance to be here today and I'll look forward to it. Great, Th thanks very much, Doug. Great way to kick off this panel. Uh, Carlo, go to you next. Thank you, Mark. Thanks for the opportunity. Uh, just a couple of words about my background because that background shapes a little bit my views, right? Uh, I'm Right now I'm a consultant to the pharmaceutical industry and I've had the honor of supporting the operations world speed and the federal COVID response for the last year. And so seeing really close um, a real shock to the supply chain generated by COVID. But for my career for the previous 30 plus years, I've been managing manufacturing operations for a very large generics manufacturer and for a biopharma company. So I've spent most of my life trying to build a compliant, resilient, cost-effective supply chain. And as we have heard today, uh, balancing these three requirements is not easy. And the incentives in the different segments of the business you are in drive the solution and, and the balance between these three factors. Um, a biotech company, a large pharma innovative company, the financials play in a very different way than for a generics. Um, we have heard that and is absolutely true. In peacetime, in the supply chain disruptions, are due to failures in manufacturing. We have heard that most of those failures are driven by quality issues. But if you really look at the shortages, um, many of those over the years have just been the consequence of conscious decisions by manufacturers to exit the supply of certain products because just the financial incentives couldn't justify staying there. And that's where I believe the government can play a tremendous role as a buyer, a, a, a key player in this market. We certainly see governments around the world playing this role. And I think the US government is now probably coming to the awareness that this is a problem that needs intervention. The executive order uh, from uh, the current administration will allow to create more transparency and visibility, will generate data, but I am under no illusion that a complex supply chain like the pharmaceutical global supply chain can be centrally micro-plan and micromanaged. The answer for me relies in redesigning the incentives to drive behaviors that will bring the supply chain to a new equilibrium point. I like very much what I've heard from Alan from Civica before. Um, 
clearly the long-term commitment to the supply is necessary for companies to make the necessary investment decisions. Those investment decisions will go a long way into reducing the weaknesses in our supply chain, both from flexibility and operability perspective and from a compliance perspective. So the incentives need to drive this change in behaviors, need to enable the right decisions. Companies are in business to stay in business and grow. It's a competitive environment. Today, the same dynamics that have driven the growth of the generic products and the savings to the payers, thanks to the generics products, have contributed to making the supply chain of generics more brittle. So we need to find a new equilibrium point, And I think the government can play a critical role in this. Completely different story, though, for the uh, external shocks, like we have seen now with COVID, where all of a sudden, the demand far outstrips the supply and the pharmaceutical supply chain, it's slow to um, adapt to this. I think what I have seen now in the last year or so has been incredibly successful given the challenge. And anybody can say, yes, but the more could have been done. And yes, but uh, we have seen failures, true. But if you compare this with peacetime development of new pharmaceutical, new vaccines, and creation and ramp up of a supply chain, I think what has been done globally, worldwide, is nothing short of exceptional. So the opportunities are huge, and we have demonstrated to have the willingness to address them in a situation like the one we have faced in the last 12 months. I really hope that um, the transparency and the visibility that will be created through the mapping of the supply chain will help the right decisions. All of the suggestions that I've heard so far today are all very relevant and certainly can go a long way into improving. The one other aspect I will add is we need to invest in the human capital. You know, fixing a manufacturing facility, it's the easy part, is usually the fast part. Building a workforce which has a culture of quality, which has the technical skills to manufacture reliably and consistently good quality pharmaceutical product, that takes a generation. And I'm sorry to say we are behind most of the rest of the world in this and we need to catch up and i really hope that policy will take that into account great uh, carlo thanks very much for those comments and uh, next i'd like to go to jessica all right thank you mark i appreciate being uh participating in today's panel so again as mark said my name is jessica daly i serve as the vice president of pharmaceutical strategic supplier engagement for the Premier Healthcare Alliance, which is a, a unique opportunity for me to intersect with our 1300 manufacturers, 4,100 US hospitals and health systems, and 200,000 other provider sites so that we can focus on securing the highest quality cost-effective products and services while also focusing very intently on generating drug supply chain resiliency. So based on that, I, I do wanna comment on two main topics today how our policymakers can support improved drug supply chain resiliency, and what the role of the public-private partnership can be in this space. So first, Premier has always encouraged our policymakers to support improving the drug supply chain resiliency in a few key areas. We outlined some very detailed discussion around these areas in a public response to the recent executive order, but I do want to highlight just a couple of those, uh, of those items here today. So first, we do encourage our policymakers to incentivize and uh, incentivize domestic manufacturing, primarily through a two-part approach to tax incentives. We're ultimately looking to address the major barriers, barriers that many of we have talked about here today for onshore manufacturing, including capacity, environmental regulations, labor costs, availability of raw materials, and historical policy decisions that have advantaged offshoring. 
However, while we, we do recognize the importance of incentivizing domestic manufacturing, we also want to recognize that there is a need to ensure global diversity, and I know many of us have talked about this. The movement of substantially all manufacturing onshore can, could, al could also create a similar over-reliance on a single geographic region that can cause problems for us in the future, so it's important to have that balance. Secondly, to truly create a long-term domestic manufacturing infrastructure that's sustainable, policymakers should consider addressing committed purchase volumes, diverse supplier so, uh, sourcing for government purchasing activities, and also purchase thresholds that can help prioritize that domestic manufacturing, again, while also ensuring global diversity and sustainability. It's important for policymakers to also consider incentives for the healthcare providers to purchase domestically manufactured critical drugs through programs such as tax incentives or even CMS bonus payments so that we can offset the higher acquisition costs that may be associated with domestically manufactured goods. And we also strongly support the administration's efforts to strengthen the strategic national stockpile. We encourage our policymakers to address SNS improvements through the establishment of public-private partnerships creating a true end-to-end -end supply chain solution that is importantly transparent, diverse, and reliable. So to accomplish that, policy changes will be needed to provide data rights, create, uh, to, to create predictive algorithms, and to acquire and utilize data for surveillance. It will be very important to create transparent and diverse sourcing structures so that we can encourage, uh, so that we can ensure that raw materials or ancillary products or finished goods, all of the different components of the pharmaceutical supply chain that we've already discussed are supplied in a reasonable time frame that's also responsive to not only the surge demands but existing commercial market needs. And it's also going to be very important to create a multi-committee structure for this pu uh, public-private partnership so that we can ensure that the appropriate expertise is represented support collaborative decision-making, remain unbiased with our and vendor agnostic, and to identify innovative products and continuously refine the, divi this, the vision of the SNS. And although I, I did just talk about public-private partnerships as part of the, the need for policy change, I do wanna focus my final comments on some important work that has already been done in the public-private partnership area, especially since the beginning of the pandemic. So Premier has had a strong history in advancing for uh, the need for a public-private partnership structure. We played a critical role in the creation of the COVID-19 private sector supply chain coalition. And importantly, also recently, our CEO, Susan DeVore, participated in the disaster preparedness and response initiative between the Healthcare Leadership Council and the Duke Margolis Center. The report that was generated through that critical initiative addresses improved disaster coordination and collaboration and establishes a list of key actions that can be taken by both policymakers and private organizations that support data and evidence generation, strengthening innovation and supply chain readiness, and expanding innovative care delivery approaches. So public-private partnerships are, can generate significant insight into solutions that can address the drug supply chain resiliency and shouldn't be underestimated as a critical tool that is at our disposal. So I just want to, again, thank you for allowing me to comment today, and I look forward to taking questions. Great. Uh, th thank you very much, Jessica. Some great topics. And uh, next, uh, Rena. Yeah, thank you so much, Mark, again. Fantastic panel. Um, so so just, just to kind of level set, we have lived through a worldwide pandemic. And when you look at actually, at, you look at statistics on drug supply and drug demand, we actually look pretty good. Um, our supply chain has been remarkably resilient um, for the products that people use every single day in the States. So it's really important in the face of a pandemic to, um, uh, to think about exactly what we should, what, what are the policy problems that we want to solve for. Um, really the vast majority of my remarks are gonna be about reshoring. So I think reshoring is important, um, but for what remains an open question. And specifically most of our modern economic system rests on comparative advantage. And specifically that there are significant gains in trade from our consistent, reliable, 
uh, trade partners in Europe, um, in Canada and Mexico, and also um, uh, in India. And so it is clear that, yeah, time and time again, when we have relied on that system, uh, uh, European manufacturers, Indian manufacturers, again, have provided safe and secure quality manufactured goods with some notable exceptions. Um, so what we want to change is critically important and really, really fundamentally addresses trade balances um, that uh, are really, I think, when we're thinking about supply chain resiliency, aren't we're not comfortable talking about. Um, the second is um, there is therapeutic obsolescence in this market. Every day, every day products become not that important uh, and, product and companies exit those markets. So it's important to consider that when we're building capacity that uh, we want to actually ensure just not for now, but also for, um, for a little bit of the future as well. Um, base ingredients, um, other types of equipment seem like natural places to focus on. The fact that we have a worldwide uh, shortage in glass vials when we're sitting on so much sand <laughs> seems completely a very significant mis misfortune and one that actually could be good for the US, um, both for ensuring our own supply, but for, again, um, thinking about our trade partners, we can also be net exporters of some of these products. Um, as we've seen um, with vaccine manufacturing in India, this could actually be incredibly important um, uh, focus uh, for us. And then finally, um, I just wanna pick up a comment that Doug Holtz Eakin made, which is, um, it's really important, I think, for us to think through what have been uh, the investments that we've already made in um, ensuring uh, robust supply. Certainly BARDA has played an incredibly important role here. Um, and it would be really nice to know a little bit more about what we've gained from those investments. And also moving forward, we should certainly trust but verify. Um, not only should we be giving funds to these to private manufacturers, but we should be asking them to provide reports back on exactly how they are um, contributing and whether or not they are contributing in ways that both further their own private interests, but also further the public's interest. Thank you. I look forward to the discussion. Great. Thanks very much. You all made some excellent points, and it's uh, easy to see some themes emerging here that even as more of this work around the executive order, congressional investigation and analysis is going on, some uh, um, promising directions forward. Let me start with the theme of transparency that many of you mentioned. I wanted to follow up in particular on since People talk about end-to-end -end transparency, um, and uh, Doug uh, mentioned the, uh, the need for stress testing uh, on that end-to-end, -end. so APIs, manufacturing, uh, key bottleneck consumables, Arena was just talking about vials. Um, uh, Jessica, you talked about this being a public-private partnership, so I have to ask you quickly, uh, how exactly would you see this working since manufacturers are going to have to give up some or share some information they currently regard quite uh, as proprietary. And Carlo, I know you've been thinking about this for a long time too. So maybe some comments on how we can best get this um, transparency system in, in place. Sure, Mark. Thank you. So we've seen that other public-private partnerships in this space can work very well. There is an expectation that information that is shared in those forums is kept confidential. So there, there is an element of trust that needs to be brought into these discussions. But the end of what we're all trying to accomplish here is providing that stability and resilience in the drug supply chain. So it benefits every single person in the United States to have a strong and resilient supply chain. If we don't have the clarity of information to, to do modeling and to create a data infrastructure that allows us to 
to pressure test to Doug's point and to look at where there may be challenges or, or you know, weakest link in the chain, right? Even just some examples recently with some of the contract manufacturers for vaccines, knowing that certain manufacturers may be contracting for multiple manufacturing um, supplier partners where that can cause some additional challenges. Rena had mentioned that earlier as well with API, having multiple manufacturers all reliant on the same source mm -hmm. of API. If we don't have that clarity, it's very hard to do the pressure testing and to work through where there will be challenges or opportunities for failure. So the importance of that public public private partnership and showing the consistency and keeping that information confidential, making sure that we build that trust and accountability with those partnership members is going to be very important. Uh, Carlo, your thoughts on how to make this work better? Well, listen, uh, after the financial crisis, we all learned the concept about systemically important institution, right? And um, we had the same situation happen in the pharmaceutical supply chain with the Valsartan and Ranitidin issue. Uh, it was a well-known secret. There are certain supply chain that appear to be diversified and with uh, redundancy built in, but at the very end, they all collapsed into a single point of failure. And if that point fails, the whole supply chain falls apart. Well, I think the government has a role to play to create that visibility. The industry will adapt to the rules which are given. Of course, it's nice to have a trade secret and use it as a competitive advantage, but if nobody can have this kind of trade secret, the industry will live by it. And I think now it's an opportunity with this supply chain assessment that will be done to create that visibility, identify these critical risks, and then determine what is the right policy action to address this risk. Because the system, the way it's designed, will always collapse to the highest efficient supplier and will always collapse on the most efficient supply chain, not necessarily the most resilient one. And all of you mentioned in one way or another that notion of onshoring as being uh, something that's desirable, and I'll, I'll put words in your mouth a little bit, to some extent uh, to have more robust supply, uh, but also going too far could add uh, maybe unnecessarily to expense and create its own um, insecurities by being regionally dependent. So this is for any of you. Um, it, this seems like a good foundational issue since there will be more legislation related to this topic, particularly in relation to uh, I'm, uh, reliance on China as we've seen some worries arise during the, the pandemic and more recently with trends in um, uh, trade and, uh, and economic cooperation. Um, what's the right balance there? How should we be thinking about that? So, so let me briefly just say two things. Um, first, um, I want to echo what, what Rena said uh, at the outset, which is we went through this global pandemic and by and large did really well. So everyone take a deep breath and underreact, right? That, that would be a really good thing right now. Uh, second thing I would say is there's a big difference between not China and everything in the United States. And again, she said this very well, we're not going to undo centuries of economics that have produced a comparative advantage to, to producing these drugs in complicated supply chains around the globe. And we shouldn't try to. We should instead focus on those sorts of stress tests and other tools that would allow us to get the thing that US customers want. Drugs at a reasonable price reliably in the circumstances that we can anticipate. And, and that's, that's more important than putting anything on the US shores. Okay, um, I appreciate the comments. I wanna move on. So there were a number, just to summarize, there were a number of comments related to regulatory supports to create a more robust supply, especially in the generic industry, but maybe more generally, these included regulatory changes to better encourage continuous manufacturing. Um, several of you uh, during this pan during this whole session, uh, the meeting have uh, talked about um, on-demand modular manufacturing, potentially for more uh, advanced and complex uh, uh, products 
products and more regulatory transparency around the quality of different uh, manufacturers and that they're not just going to the minimum level, but uh, doing well in terms of API uh, reliability, uh, et cetera. Um, so I put a pin in that and I want to talk to what we we'll talk about what we do about it, because this is where I think more of the actual federal spending could potentially come in and be done in a, in a, in a good or bad way back to, to Doug's original framing. So we've talked about generic issues. We talked about shock response issues, especially uh, pandemic on our minds. Um, on the generic side, uh, more reliable manufacturing contracts that are longer term, advanced purchase arrangements, et cetera. That seems to be starting to happen already with what uh, Civic is doing, uh, Premier, uh, and so forth. So it'd be good to know if any of you have any further thoughts about what the government can do to facilitate that. Uh, but then in terms of our next uh, uh, shock or pandemic uh, preparedness, keeping in mind, as Doug said, that things uh, obviously could have been worse. You know, one of the challenges with the, the stockpile response post 9-11 was that lasted for a little while. We thought what we knew what we wanted to stockpile, but um, attention went elsewhere. And it turned out that the threats we needed to be prepared for ramping up were quite different from what we'd actually put in the uh, put in the stockpiles in many cases to the extent we were continuing them. So I'd appreciate as we wrap up just some last comments, because this is where significant federal resources could be directed in the form of tax credits, uh, in the form of, say, um, additional contracts through BARDA to create some more uh, reserve capacity or, or create some um, uh, a buffer of some of the most critical products. Uh, this is where things could go well or, or could, uh, could result in something that's not sustainable and, uh, and not effective. So uh, I'd like to ask for just maybe closing comments from each of you on, on this topic topic of, of what uh, kinds of uh, tax or financial supports should we be starting to think about as part of this manufacturing uh, resilience response. Uh, Doug, you want to start? No, but I will. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so first, uh, uh, long ago and far away when I was getting a PhD in economics, my specialty was tax policy. And I beg of you, please stop trying to use the tax system to solve all problems. Uh, it's not a good tool. And in particular, if you've got um, an entity that's going through a terrible time like a pandemic, it might not have any taxable profits and tax incentives have no incentive as a result. So this is an important problem. If it's important enough to spend the taxpayer's dollar, do it openly and, and just put it on the outlay side and be done with it. I, I just think we've got to get over this obsession with using taxes to solve all these problems. Um, I, I think that's really, really important. Um, Again, I'm concerned about just exactly what you you mentioned, Mark, which is that um, you know we we we've been through this once before and, and it turned out we weren't anticipating the right thing. So again, let's let's identify the real problems, and we we do seem to have some some issues in the generics market that I would love to hear the other panelists comment on. It's not my area of expertise, but it, it's been price spikes in sole source generics as much as anything that have brought the pharmaceutical industry under congressional attack. And so dealing with this problem, I think, is, is important, A, on, on the primary merits. We need patients to get the drugs they need at the right uh, times. But B, to, to actually provide a stable environment for this industry to go forward. Jessica, do you want to go next? I know you've been working on uh, those reliable uh, generic supply issues extensively. Yeah, sure. Thank you, Mark. So um, I'll make a couple of comments because uh, to Doug's chagrin, I think we do believe that there is a role for tax incentives. That there has to be a way to help manufacturers offset some of the investment. Well, write them a check. Mm -hmm. write them that, or, or Just write them a check. <laughs> that, <laughs> if that's the way we do it, there has to be a way to incentivize manufacturers to, to bring quality manufacturing into a location that is stable and secure. And we've seen that, you know, the nice thing about the, the uh, US pharmaceutical market and what we've seen from a premier perspective is there are a lot of pharmaceutical suppliers in the market who, who we can work very closely with to identify opportunities to bring new products back to the market or, or bring someone new to the market to further support the supply of those products. So I think it's very important that we make sure you know, when we think about BARDA or writing a check, right? There are existing manufacturers that we could work with very well from a federal government perspective to bring back supply security, to make sure we're manufacturing those products and investing in a diverse supply chain. 
But one of the big challenges that we're going to continue to run into unless we address it um, very effectively is that the providers have to buy the medication to use it. So I know, Carlo, I think you had mentioned talking about using the government as a buyer. That's an important function that we need to understand how the government is prioritizing or strategizing around investing or purchasing of pharmaceuticals. But each healthcare provider in the United States has a buy side decision chain that they are that they're looking at. And so if we're not also incentivizing our providers to make the right choice and choose the products that have high quality, sustainable and resilient supply chains, we're going to continue to come back to this position where we're constantly talking about how do we do this better. So we need to look at how we incentivize providers as well. All right. Uh, thanks. Uh, Rena, can I go to you next? Yeah, thank you. Um, so the first is that we need to pay manufacturers for performance. So if we're going to provide money to flow to them to increase resiliency, um, increase quality, then we're going to have to be ready to, to uh, measure that and also to uh, hold them to it. Um, the second is um, I, I want to pick up on a, on a comment that Doug made. I'm in complete agreement that we really need to think harder about reimbursement uh, policy here. And, and in two ways. The, the first is, is that we have some reimbursement policies in place that actually promote race to the bottom uh, uh, thinking from the manufacturer's perspective. Um, when we bundle products together, um, when we um, institute max that uh, really pay the lowest price, for certain types of products by statute, that does not create the right incentives for these manufacturers to go out and then do the right thing and invest in resiliency. Um, one of the things that European countries do, particularly in um, the face of um, important products for which um, I, you know, supply shortages would be a national problem, is they, they tender offers or um, they uh, reward manufacturing for trusted manufacturers. They don't let the rest of the system figure it out um, for, for payers. Um, or they just simply pay more for products that really are critically important. And I do think all of these reimbursement incentives, um, it's time to re rethink some of these things as well. Yeah, and that gets back to your point about paying for outcomes. Uh, Carlo, can I give you the, the last word on this, given everything you've lived through the last uh, year and a half? <laughs> so I, I like the idea of paying more for quality products, right? And I believe the regulators know very well where the compliance and quality risks are. Again, so creating the transparency within the industry about that would be an important first step. I think also collaboration. We talk a lot about onshoring. It's important because it gives control, but it's not the solution. I think we all have agreed it's not the final and only solution to the supply chain resiliency. I think international collaboration need to increase collaborations across regulators. Um, regulators know the industry and they keeping their role as regulators they can really act more proactively into driving improvement in quality and compliance, uh, provided the government is willing to fund them appropriately and allow to the increase in resources they need. So I think all what I've heard, these are all very good and positive solutions. My last word would be, please believe that the pharmaceutical industry is committed to resolving this problem. The industry suffers about the perception about the pharmaceutical supply chain just as much as anybody else. Oh, great, thank you. And on that note, I wanna thank um, uh, all of our panelists for this session, great discussion on steps that we can take now and things that we can do to, for watch outs and for guidance for the work forward from here. Uh, I wanna thank all of our prior panelists for joining today and helping us put together this uh, very timely look at uh, supply resiliency for drugs, biologics and vaccines, and also all of our participants. We had some great uh, questions and comments. We try to work as many of them in, uh, 
as we could. Uh, and so we appreciate all of the expertise and perspectives that have come together here today. Uh, we are going to be keeping with this topic. So uh, this is was not the first, not gonna be the last uh, event from Duke Margolis on um, robust and uh, resilient uh, manufacturing. Uh, so stay tuned and, and uh, uh, look for more announcements from us about, about reports and activities in this area. And then uh, a special thanks to our team here at Duke, uh, Adam Kretsch, Stephen Colville, Thomas Rhodes, and Luke DeRocher. Uh, De Rocher. Um, and also a special thanks to Marta Wazinska. This is actually her last event at uh, Duke Margolis before she heads off to lead uh, uh, the uh, Economics Bureau at the Federal Trade Commission, where I hope she'll be having an impact on these issues as well. Uh, thanks to all of you for joining us today, and please enjoy the rest of your afternoon. <laughs>